We live in a world full of art. The government spends millions of dollars to provide us with incredible museums. There are dance companies, Broadway, and due to apps like Visco and Instagram, the photography industry is growing like never before. Art is very much in the mainstream. But what about the artistry we don't recognize? What if something isn't a work of art, but happens to be very artistic? How much do you really notice? Noticing the details and appreciating much more things can lead to a better perception of Earth itself. We have an incredible creator who made a place for us to dwell and gave us our own abilities to create. Many of us use our creative abilities to directly worship him. But what about the art that doesn't directly point back to God? What does that mean? Art is a very important part of my life, and I believe it should be an important part of everybody else's as well. For a long time, I've wanted to address these questions. I've done a lot of thinking, searching, and creating on the subject. I want to share with you what I've learned through my search within myself, with God, and with other people. My big question is, where are all of the places we see and feel artistry? A big part of what I'm doing here is just raising awareness as to how much artistry is around us. I want everyone to see absolutely everything with some sort of deeper underlining meaning or emotion. And one of the biggest things we can see this in is other people, which is why I decided to select um, a particular group of faculty and students in the high school to show what we have going on within the school itself, to shed positive light, um, to show how cool these people are, and to show the diverse personalities there are around us. And these interviews are mainly just to see who they are and how I see them. Hi, I'm Tammy Gorman. I teach math in the high school at Winesville Christian School, and I also um, run National Honor Society. I'm the advisor. I like to run obstacle courses, and I like to read. So I guess your definition of cool, my definition of cool might be different, but I make cool stuff every day <laughs> um, because I teach math. And I think every time I do a problem on the board and do all the steps and have all the numbers line up so nice and pretty, I think that's pretty cool. I don't know if it directly points back to him when I see, I, mean, I see art, I see beauty in, in nature mostly. Um, and, and no one painted that picture or put Jesus' name on the tree, but you know, as I'm driving down the street this past week and the beauty of the leaves and I was observing that there was only one kind of tree left that still had leaves on it because they all had the same color leaves. And I just thought that was cool that um, the trees are designed to have different color leaves and they drop them at different times so that we get to see all their, you know, there probably was this tree that was hidden behind this other big tree. So I see God in nature all the time. Um, I think about that question, I think about the word, um, why is creating important to Christianity? And I think about God and he was the, the ultimate creator. So if you think about that, um, he is our example, wanting us to create stuff. And then I also think about what our purpose is, like what are, is our purpose? And our purpose is, I mean, God designed us so that we would love him. And I was thinking about that and um, how do we do that? And the way we express that is through art and creating and praying and writing songs and drawing pictures and, and doing things that um, bring glory to God. So I almost think that art is probably the thing that God designed us to do. I can't draw, I can't paint. I can arrange flowers though, I'm very good at that. Um, but art to me is just, when I think of art, I think of beauty. And I think there's beauty in everything that you do, um, as long as it's a joyful act. So, you know, when I come to the end of the day and I've solved a really cool math problem with my kids, I think that's art.
theory of self-curation. As long as I've lived, I've always had a habit of really analyzing people. And it's one of my favorite things to do. Self-curatorship is a term I coined, and what it really means is just how we live our everyday lives. Part of this documentary is just realizing how artistry is in absolutely everything we do. How we talk and, you know, what we eat, even how we walk, is all curated by ourselves. And some of this is intentional and some of this isn't intentional. It's a nature versus nurture thing. We choose oftentimes our senses of humor, uh, what we say in any given moment. We choose our friends, we choose what we wear. But we also see it in key personality traits. And some of this self-curation is inevitable. We don't control it. It's how we were born. We have a personality that is part of who we are. But we do choose certain things. Like we choose what we eat. We choose what friends we have. And that all goes into exactly who you are. And that's why it's curation, because you're picking and choosing and, you know, xing things out and adding things in to create your final product. This is why I think it is so important to always be 100% yourself all of the time, the best self you can be. Because number one, you owe it to God because he made you who you are and you want to honor that. But number two, we're all made so uniquely, I don't want to miss out on that. I want to know who everyone is. I want to know what kind of person someone truly is and I want everyone to know who I truly am. So that's why one of my big philosophies, as long as I've lived, is to always be 100% myself. When it comes to self-curation and who you are and personality and it, you have to see a person as a whole to really understand that, yes, there is how, you know, how they look and how they dress, but what about their sense of humor? What about all of their likes and dislikes? What about the way they walk down the hallway? There's so much to it. There's so much that goes into it. And you know, whether that's nature versus nurture and what we choose versus the inevitable, it's there. Kelly Penning. I teach. I also coach um, assistant varsity volleyball and assistant varsity basketball. My hobbies are this school because my world revolves around it. I like coaching. I like playing volleyball and basketball in my free time. Hanging out with friends. Um, I also really like going to the movies. That's something my family has always liked to do. I think that creating art as someone who is not so much artistic, I think that seeing art and other people being able to create art, it just shows such a different side of people. And God has created us in so many ways with so many different gifts and abilities. And I think that that is such an expressive way to show a lot of those things. Um, I really, especially coming at it, like at a Christian school, having played at a Christian school and now coaching at a Christian school. I think that knowing how to be competitive and knowing what the game is um, in light of Christianity is really something that I strive for. So how to behave um, on the court, off the court as a coach, I think that that really shows a lot of God, like to other schools especially. So I think that that is a really big part of it, just modeling Christ through actions. I think it's everywhere. I always think about how 
This world is so big and God made people so differently and there's so many cultures that it is our job to get to know other people. That's one more way, one more person that you can talk to, that you can um, be an example of God to, that you can preach to. Honestly, I mean, I, I love my students. I love each one of them and that is such a big thing because sometimes getting wrapped up in how much I'm at school or how much I'm doing. If I didn't love it with every fiber of my being, it would be hard, but I do. I love coming to school every day. They, they just make my day. And I think having the range of elementary, middle, and high school, I just feel so connected to so many of the students that I've just built relationships with them year to year. And I think that especially the older ones, just being able to um, relate to them and to know that it just builds that trust and that relationship. And that really goes a long way, I think, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. I'm Ben Casey, I'm a student at WCS. I am currently in drama and tennis, student council, and middle school mentor groups. And in the fall, I also do soccer. For my hobbies outside of school, I like to hunt, fish, camp. Uh, I, I like to do woodwork. Um, I like to drum, and I also play the violin. When I do the activities that I like to do, it helps me relax a little bit because I generally have a lot of school stuff that I'm working on at the time and then it just helps me kind of take a step back and then, you know, like a refresher almost. A lot of the a lot of the things that you can see, especially outside, like all the crazy different like tree formations and rocks that come up and different scale patterns on fish are definitely way more complex than what you would originally think before looking at it closely. I like to, like the stuff that I do outside, like the, especially with the woodworking and the hunting together, and occasionally other stuff gets brought into it, but I like just being outside and seeing what I can do with it. So when I'm camping, I like to be able to see what I can, you know, make with a tree that's falling over there, like get a bench going or get a fire going, or when I'm woodworking, like, oh, it's a cool piece of wood outside in the woods that I could take in and I can, make something out of that. I kind of just like re repurposing what I find outside and such.
theory of intention. There are many different kinds of art. We have all the different theories, we have all the different types, um, and I think a really big player in this theory is Impressionism. And this isn't quite a new theory I'm coming up with, it's just reiterating in more simplified or modern terms, because this is really what Impressionism is anyway. If we are painting a piece, um, we can make things very literal. We could paint a picture of a crying woman and say this, this is sadness. But then we can take that a step further and make the picture blue, because I think most of us can agree that blue is a sad color. But, like most Impressionists, we can take this another step forward. Does the way you move your lines, does that convey something? Where do your eyes go first? And I think a really good example of this is Paul Cezanne. It gets even further when we can be painting a picture of something like the portrait with apples. And although it's just a portrait with apples, if you're thinking, man, you know, this is where I'm at, maybe I'm not doing so well right now, that portrait really portrays that emotion. You can see that in all of Paul Cezanne's years. If you look at his portrait with apples and it, it invokes that feeling within you, it's not a happy picture. And although it's just a picture of apples, I think we can all agree this isn't light-hearted. It's quite clear that during that time, Paul Cezanne was struggling with some serious depression. And I think it's extremely interesting that we can paint something like an apple and just be thinking in our heads where we're at, what we're feeling, and it comes out displaying that feeling. I'm Libby Corsio. I'm a senior at Whitensville Christian School. I take AP Art, and my senior capstone project is teaching art to elementary students. I love my friends. Whenever anyone says like, "Oh, what do you like about school? What do you, you know, what do you do?" It's always my friends. I could talk about my friends to my family forever. Like each single one of them, I could just say like something funny that they did that I thought was funny at least, or what they're doing, or what they want to do. And I think that that can contribute to how I'm feeling 100%. Like, if I'm having a bad day and then I do something with my friends, like we do this, it's kind of like not the biggest thing in the world, but it's fun. And like, personally, I use art as a form of self-expression. Uh, I think it's one of the best ways that we can express ourselves because it's not anything to do with how we look or how we might talk or act because it's kind of a whole separate thing from that. It's kind of a visual representation of whatever we might be thinking or feeling. I liked teaching to the little kids because I didn't teach anything technique-wise because I don't really think I'm qualified to teach about that. But I taught more idea and concept-wise where I focused on creative self-expression a lot. So it didn't have to be... We never did anything formal or anything that looked exactly like a person or an animal or a tree or something. It was more like we would take the medium that we had, we used paint and crayons and stuff, and we would try to apply it in different ways to maybe express how they were feeling. So we talked about different emotions and we would paint with our hands and our feet and we would do splatter painting. We looked at Jackson Pollock's artwork a lot. And I like that kind of stuff because it doesn't have to look like anything and it's more about the process. And I really like teaching that to little kids because I think it's something that they might not always do in a classroom setting.
I think I like that idea because especially now, the age we are now, like every single day we're kind of almost, not necessarily a different person, but kind of evolving with more ideas and more ways of expressing ourselves and we're growing in that sense and so I like expressing that and kind of almost having a timeline of that or some sort of visual representation of what might be mostly <laughs> in our heads and I like kind of having that timeline of being able to say even though now I might not do what I did when I was 10 when I was 10 I did it and I still have that as kind of a reminder that I have come a certain amount of you know space no. <laughs> no. there is a certain amount of space between when I was 10 and now and being able to have that kind of in a physical form for myself and for other people to look at if they'd like to I think it's cool The theory of the artistic lens. I envision what I call the artistic lens as a film over your entire life. How you see your life as you know it. Everything you do, everything you see, you need to see it through a point of view where you're looking at everything and saying, you know, what does this mean? What does this look like and what does it not look like? We can all look at the weather outside. And some of us are optimistic and we say, wow, it's some beautiful weather. We take a moment to really appreciate it, you know, smell all the roses. And some people can look at it and they're not feeling anything at all because they're too caught on something else or this or that. But, you know, I, com I completely understand that because it's not always easy to just look at everything and say, wow, this is so beautiful because everything is not beautiful by any means. We have countries all around us filled with poverty, with war with disagreement and I think by living through this artistic lens when you see the bad you see it with the good and it makes the good stand out even more honestly if I didn't highlight the bad in my own life I wouldn't appreciate the good and I think this is the struggle of any artist really this is the struggle because as an artist you need to see the good and the bad and when you're really immersed in that bad it pulls you down it's why so many go insane and so many have such deep mental things going on it's because you have to take all the good and all the bad and yes it makes those great moments such a high it's incredible but you see so much of the bad in even reflecting that in your own work so much of the time can really bring you down. So when you're looking at your life, looking at relationships, looking at how people carry themselves and their curatorship, looking at, you know, the intention behind everything everyone does, what emotion is affecting it, that artistic lens will help you appreciate and just love your life more. Because honestly, if I didn't look at my life and at everything with some sort of you know, emotion or meaning behind it, I don't know what I would think of life. But we have a God who created everything around us and there is good and there is so much bad in this world and we need to acknowledge both to really appreciate what he gave us. Yeah.
Hi, I'm Matt Janice, and I teach at Whitensville Christian School a bunch of different subjects. I teach English, mass media, and Christian leadership right now. And I also play music on the weekends, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, outside of school, I spend a lot of time with my kids, and um, we like to watch movies and play games, and we play Uno. Uh, in this room, and uh, we have a lot of fun. Winner gets five dollars, unless it's me. My most favorite hobby is writing music. My favorite thing to do is to write music, and I don't play it when I play out in my shows. But yeah, I've been writing music since I was about 15 or 16 years old, and it started for me as something where I could uh, really just process my feelings through it and it was a big thing of catharsis for me. I got to kind of process um, some depression and loneliness and some ideas of hope. And uh, there was always something with music that when you write a song it's, um, and you finish it, it's like you're cataloging this mode or event or season of your life and it's like a permanent record of what you were feeling and thinking at one time in your life. Um, so it's almost like a musical journal is how I look at writing music. I don't really see a definite line between Christian art and non-Christian art. And I'm gonna to try to explain why I don't really see a line. Obviously, I'm willing to recognize that there are overt attempts to um, express faith and that is probably what we're calling Christian art. And then you have those who don't. But, uh, and all of the hymns and, and praise songs and stuff that seem to be overtly attempting to um, express faith, I've definitely gleaned a lot of um, good things from those. But as far as how I see God, I've seen more of um, God through art that didn't attempt to have a Christian bend to it. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a songwriter that I, I listen to all the time, John Gorka. It's a little bit more human focused, but at the same time, when I hear someone like him writing music, I see that the fingerprints of God are on this guy, whether he wants to acknowledge it or not. It, it comes out in this this merciful tone that he has in his music and also his way of just seeing people and kind of honoring the, the freedoms that people have. And I think that's a, a Christian thing. Uh, I don't think it's a very prominent Christian theme nowadays, but I think we, we would do well to um, make that idea more prominent, that people's pain and people's free will is something to be honored, even if we don't agree with it. At the end of the day, when it comes to your friendships, when it comes to what you eat, when it comes to what you say, what you do, and what you see, we just need to remember that everything about everything we do is incredibly artistic. We need to remember that 
everything has meaning and emotion, and there's always a deeper step behind everything that we see and what we do. And we need to notice that, we need to be aware of that. This, is, this documentary is for awareness. And at the end of the day, what we really need to realize is art and beauty is a part of everything. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> hey Christian, you wanna hop in on this? I need another boy. 